Councillor Lee Hunt, the Cabinet Minister for Community Safety. And okay, on sorry the screen... to interrupt you, and you are now live. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cabinet Members for Community Safety Decision Meeting. I am Councillor Lee Hunt, the Cabinet Member for Community Safety. Uh, we are meeting virtually in response to the limitations placed on governance by the COVID-19 pandemic. Until recently, the law stated that all members had to be present in the room to make formal decisions at that meeting. However, the law was amended uh, in response to the COVID-19 emergency, and councils are able to hold public meetings virtually, i.e. in this way. This will be in accordance with the local authorities, coronavirus, flexibility of local uh, authority meetings, regulations uh, 2020, number 392, in brackets, the regulations. Members of the public are invited to view this meeting, and there has been opportunity for written re representations uh, to be submitted. And Mr. Ma, the officer in the case of this matter, will uh, read one such deputation out shortly. Those present are requested to keep their microphones on mute and only to turn them on when they are called to speak. Members are requested to keep their cameras turned on at all times. Officers are requested to turn their cameras on only when they are presenting their reports or answering questions. If anyone would like to speak, please write their name and uh, in the uh, in the um, uh, in the comments bar, write RTS request to speak in the chat. Now, here come the introductions. I would like to invite those present to introduce themselves. And we'll start with uh, Councillor Corkery. And I understand that uh, Councillor Semenyu uh, is happy with the report and um, uh, is, is not attending today because he's unwell. Councillor Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Cal Corkery, the Labour spokesperson for community safety. Mr. Ma. Good afternoon, I'm Bruce Maher, Head of Harm and Exploitation of Portsmouth City Council. And uh, if I can send apologies from Alison Jeffrey, the Director of Children's Services. Much obliged you. And we're supported today by Joe Didino. Are you there, Joe? I'm here as Jane Didino for Local Democracy Officer. And what Jane does is she records the, uh, she may, takes the minutes and records the decision and so on. We're also supported today um, by Peter, Peter Smith by Parking. We're very grateful for that, and he helps us when we get into trouble online, as it were. Right. So the apologies for absence I've done. Uh, are there any other? Uh, we've heard about Alison Jeffrey from Mr. Ma. Are there any declarations of interest? Okay. So today we're here. We're hearing a report that's going to be uh, presented by Mr. Ma. Uh, so, would you like to uh, go ahead, Mr. Mar? And do we hear Ms. Meller's um, deputation first of all? Yes, I've got a deputation from Kirsty Meller, and I will read okay. it out uh, at the beginning. Okay. So today we're considering the commission now of uh, the uh, domestic uh, abuse services at Portsmouth City Council to conjoin with the other services that we already commissioned. And the reason for this is to prefer, to, to uh, better provide the services for those people who need them. So, Mr. Ma, would you like to, um, do you want to do the outline of the report first, so people understand what Ms. Mello will be talking about, or do the deputation first of all? Jane, any rest? Um, normally it's first. Okay, do the deputation first, then, Mr. Ma. Right. Uh, so this is a deputation from Kirsty Mello. I'd like to begin by recognising the domestic abuse provision we have in our city and thanks the, thank those who provide it. This extremely important service is delivered in a challenging financial climate. With more resources, these services will be able to achieve so much more. Stephen Morgan MP and I recognise that there is a need for drastic change, therefore will we, be, we will be submitting parliamentary questions to lobby the government for the reform of domestic abuse services. It is vital that we acknowledge that domestic abuse against women has its roots in the deeply ingrained inequality between men and women, and is part of a spectrum of violence against women 
which is at a crisis level in our society. Women's Aid states, unless we recognize the gender dynamics of violence against women, we do not have a hope of preventing it because prevention relies on challenging the social attitudes which allow domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women to thrive. Data indicates that the intensity and severity of violence and abusive behavior from men perpetrated against women is far more extreme with women being unable to disengage from violent partners due to uttermost fear and secondly, because the intervention from agencies is not keeping women safe. Extensive research from Hester M. 2009, titled Who Does What to Whom? Gender and Domestic Violence, was research commissioned by the Northern Rock Foundation, exploring and outlining how male victims and perpetrators of domestic violence differ from female victims and perpetrators of domestic violence. It also takes into consideration the nature and number of domestic violence incidents recorded by the police, focusing on and taking into account context and consequence, the long-term picture rather than the snapshot, in, snapshot incident. There is the recognition that some men may experience domestic abuse and men should be encouraged to, port, to report intimate partner violence. Nonetheless, male violence towards women is at alarming levels with two women dying per week at the hands of male perpetrators. It is also worrying that some men presenting as victims may sometimes be the perpetrators and the primary aggressor, often minimizing their behavior. A study by Anderson and Umberson, 2001, found that men were effective in making the less serious violence from female perpetrators appear as the main violence and at the same time excusing their own behavior so they appear rational, capable, and nonviolent. Manipulation by male perpetrators who want to remain in control leads to women being accused as the sole perpetrator, when actually the harsh reality is they are protecting themselves by retaliation. Fear keeps women trapped and stops them from engaging with the criminal justice system. Police officers have a responsibility in identifying the primary aggressor, meaning that dual arrest is only made in a handful of incidents. Best practice must always be undertaken to save lives, and intervention is key to minimizing repeat incidents. However, combining perpetrator programs and IPA support under one umbrella puts victims and survivors at huge risk. We must have a clear distinction between the two services. The Domestic Abuse Bill noted that there is a need for invest investment in perpetrator programs and for cooperation from expert providers and improved multi-agency work supporting the police. The government of the local authority must lay out a perpetrator strategy to tackle the endemic levels of domestic violence. There must be sustainable, predictable funding and any perpetrator program must always be a separate entity for many survivors' intervention. Therefore, combining such services is a cause for concern. There must and always should be a clear distinction. There is no evidence to show that significant numbers of violent relationships are dual perpetrating. The current perpetrator program in Portsmouth has no independent evaluation, therefore should be a standalone service commissioned by probation. I feel I need to speak out against these feel-good ideas and efforts to work with limited funding across all multi-agency providers. These ideas are questionable and therefore should be challenged by activists and experts in the violence against women and girls sector. With the increase of violent crime and murder, this proposal could be seen as negligent. The Safe and Together model is an internationally recognized suite of tools and interventions are designed to help child welfare professionals become domestic violence support. And she presents a link to the Safe and Together Institute and also a link to the framework for partnering with domestic violence survivors and intervening with domestic violence perpetrators, again in the Safe and Together Institute. And that's the end of her deputation.
sorry, thank Ms. Uh, Miller for her deputation. Would you like to uh, introduce the report? So the report we're proposing, our report to our members, is to seek cabinet approval to bring a contracted service and an in-house service together as one specialist service for victims and perpetrators of domestic abuse and go out to tender for that service. The recommendations is for the lead member for community safety to agree re-tender of the provision until March 2024 with an option to extend for a further three years on an annual basis a maximum contract value of around £4.4 million over the six years. And secondly, that the lead member for community safety approves an annual budget transfer of £39,500 to the children and families portfolio to recruit an additional domestic abuse practitioner for the family safeguarding service. I won't go through the background of the report because I feel it clearly lays uh, out the current provision and uh, where, how we've got to um, uh, the situation we are in for today. But the reasons and the, for the recommendations is that the proposal, I'd like to start by saying the proposal has no reflection on current provision, which is good. But we want to improve those and inline specialist domestic abuse provision into one service that is easier to access for the public, provides a consistent your needs. I recognise that there are some innovative proposals within the scope, which I believe is responsive to the concerns identified in the deputation, for example, improved interventions to keep women safe. However, I do feel combining all provision under one roof is designed to improve the response to victims. As identified in the recent domestic abuse strategic re review, where two of the five prior priorities are in relation to holding those who use abusive or unhealthy behaviours to account. This proposal increases the responsibility to challenge those who use abusive behaviour when safe to do so. This proposal will be integrated within the market engagement event I've mentioned in the report, so specialist domestic abuse providers will also have an opportunity to comment. And I'm also aware that uh, the uh, the, those making the decision today are all male adults. And I would like to stress that in bringing this proposal, there has been numerous consultation from within the network, which has included a predominantly female um, workforce. And also as a result of the innovative proposal, there is a suggestion that the provider should, be, should keep the members informed and updated on an annual basis. The proposal, as I said, is a three-year contract to extend for further three years, and if agreed, uh, the, new, the new contract it is proposed to start by the latest, the 1st of July. <coughs> That's a summary of my report, Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Before I come to you, uh, Councillor Corkery, I wonder, I wonder, Ms. Marr, could you uh, inform the meeting of the comments of the people that we currently partner with, and um, and in relation to Ms. Meller's uh, comments around funding, which I agree with, of course, I wonder if you'd be able to expand slightly uh, on the uh, ability of um, a non-local authority uh, provider being able to access lottery funds, for example, or charitable funds. I think these are important things to understand. And then I'll come straight to Councillor Cool. Yes, Chair. So in, the, in regards to the first question, I suppose what I'll point out is that Kirsty Miller is correct that two women a week have been killed. And in fact, in recent months, that's actually increased, especially in light of COVID. Uh, the concern there is that two women a week are being killed, and we've been using the statistic, which is real, for uh, over 10 years now. And actually, I agree with Kirsty Meller that interventions aren't being successful in reducing the likelihood of women being killed. Therefore, we need to consider alternative responses to some victims of domestic abuse to improve our response. I would stress that much of what Kirsty has mentioned is accurate and is relevant for many victims of domestic abuse. 
However, within our strategy, we've identified that um, it's not relevant to all victims of domestic abuse, and therefore we need to be more responsive to, to, to victims' needs. Um, our current provider, Stop Domestic Abuse, is also our partner uh, to deliver our Up To You program, having secured funding from the big lottery to expand provision already is sustained within the city. Kirsty Meller is correct in saying it is uh, we would like to get the program evaluated. It is a bespoke program for Portsmouth City Council and has been designed and written to meet our customers' needs. Um, and evaluation is, we are in discussion with the University of Portsmouth for the evaluation. But Stop Domestic Abuse as a, as a current contracted provider and delivering up to you is a women's aid feminist organization who is 100% committed to reducing violence against women and girls. Um, and therefore, um, I'm confident that we have sought to date sufficient um, guidance that the proposal is, uh, is appropriate. And as I said as well, we will be doing a market engagement event, which will be published, and therefore any provider can have a comment on the proposal. Uh, on the second bit about funding, um, yes, part of the reason of um, encouraging voluntary sector involvement is that they bring added value into uh, for residents to the city. They bring added value both by their governance arrangements through the specialist training and provision they provide, and they can bring added value by uh, accessing funding that local authorities are unable to provide. For example, recent government funding released to support uh, the demands of COVID restrictions were restricted to local uh, to uh, the voluntary sector only, and local authorities were unable to apply. So we're confident that by going out to the voluntary sector, it increases the opportunity to bring increased provision into the city, which is only beneficial to, to residents. Just making some notes here. Councillor Corkery. Have you got any questions or anything you'd like to add uh, or, or um, statements, etc. you'd like to make? Yes, thank you, Chair. I've just got a few comments. I think we've probably covered um, the questions that I had in the, the kind of informal briefing prior to this meeting. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking the deputy um, for submitting their comments. I think that's worth doing and I think it's really important that we encourage people to engage with the democratic process, uh, particularly when it relates to issues that they've got kind of personal experience or knowledge of. I think it really adds um, it adds to the process and actually the, the state of local democracy would be in a much worse place um, if we didn't have that kind of local democratic engagement from residents. So thank you very much for the comments that have been submitted. I think I'd like to start with, I guess as a trade unionist, I'm all quite often looking at these issues from the perspective of uh, staffing and from, from the workforce um, and kind of linked to that really is a belief that council services should be provided by council wherever possible. Um, I think that it has benefits in terms of um, kind of direct influence um, and control over the services that are provided as well as democratic accountability um, from local residents through their elected representatives but also it is linked to the, the treatment of staff and the pay and conditions in which they enjoy. So we know that local government employees are paid significantly better and have access to a decent pension, a much more decent pension in comparison to the typical private or voluntary sector worker. My concerns about the proposed changes to this contract in particular with regards to the IDVA service um, it, it, what this amounts to is the outsourcing of that service from the council to the voluntary sector um, and those council staff will currently be in receipt of a uh, local government pension um, kind of career average or um, average earnings or final salary whatever the setup is depends on how long they've been in it. it it seems highly likely that if they're transferred to a voluntary sector provider that provider is going to be paying um, or is going to have access to a direct contribution pension which over the course of a typical working lifetime could result in tens of thousands of pounds um, difference for kind of in loss in terms of pension entitlements. So that has a really big impact on the staff working in that service. Um, and I'd 
raise a question really of whether whether it's necessary um, to, to outsource them and make such a big difference to their earnings potential. Uh, aside from the staffing side of things, I think I've, I've listened to the comments that have been made with regards to combining um, victim and perpetrator services into into one singular service. I, I take on board the points that have been made around the potential benefits of this of a more holistic approach and also being able to offer um, to people both sides of that service. But I, I would also share the concerns that that potentially has um, in terms of the provision that's available to victims um, and really kind of echo the point that we need to to keep their needs um, really at the forefront of what we're doing and ensure that there's no that changes to service provision, service quality from their perspective. Just finally, in terms of consultation, um, I've taken board the comments that have been made with regards to consultation with the workforce. I also think that in circumstances such as these, we need to be making efforts to consult with service users, with the people that are directly using these services themselves, because um, they are also the people that have the, the kind of daily experience of the issues um, and the, the knowledge of how these services need to be structured in order to best meet their needs. Um, so, so really a kind of comment on that, um, I don't think there has been much opportunity for service users involvement or consultation so far, in, um, so far as I know, but maybe that's something that can be noted and this is kind of really a general point for all services that the council makes that we think we really need to think put service users um, and residents at the forefront of what we're doing and take on board their <coughs> needs and their interests all the way through. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Corkery. Mr. Mark, is there anything you'd like to comment on uh, following uh, from Councillor Corkery? Um, yes, I can fully appreciate and understand Corkery, Councillor Corkery's comments about um, uh, pay and conditions. Um, I want to stress that this is no reflection on the Portsmouth Infra Project's um, delivery that they've done over the years. Uh, it was set up before I took over this responsibility and has done a superb job throughout the duration. Um, the, um, the, uh, the model of intervention encourages independence from authorities and statutory providers to increase support for victims. So while it's acknowledged that this is a difficult time for those staff we are speaking about, um, nationally, predominantly, this service is provided by the voluntary sector so that it's more independent and therefore more able to challenge statutory services. Um, but I do take on board the difficult <coughs> decision in relation to the paying conditions. Um, I would like to emphasize that the, this proposal is purely and central to this is keeping victims' needs central to all decision-making. Currently, models of intervention include referrals for victims down one route and for those who use abusive behaviours down another. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's right for many individ individuals. However, that model doesn't respond to all victims' needs, um, especially victims who want to remain in the relationship or feel unable to leave the relationship. And therefore, this, the idea of this proposal is to be more responsive to a victim's needs and to support them and empowering them when safe to do so to challenge their partner or ex-partner's behaviour. Um, I would love to consult more as well with service users. We tried to do that as part of the community safety um, survey last year. Um, domestic abuse victims um, on the whole, once they've received the support, they want to move on with their lives. It's not a it's not similar to other um, uh, X services. So for example, in the substance use world where you get a number of um, uh, clients who move into providing the support themselves. Um, we have tried to consult service users and children and, um, and uh, while we've had, ha have had some response, the response is, isn't sufficient to make it, I don't know the exact word, uh, within the researcher who uses it. It's not big enough to make it uh, validated. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And uh, I, I think you say we, we, we do try very hard to consult uh, Catholic Corp. As you know, you came to some of the, uh, some of the uh, residence meetings we set up during the community safety uh, exercise when we went out on a lot of people from across the, the city 
And of course, COVID has made life very difficult for a lot of people. We've lost our officers supporting uh, what other people are doing um, within the city's um, services. So I see we've got Councillor Horton, Suji Horton, on the uh, line. And, and uh, just as you know, Councillor Horton, I did, were you been here from, were you able to hear from the beginning of the meeting? And if you could just turn your microphone on, would that be all right? Because we can't hear just at the moment. Sorry. Yeah, we're loud and clear now. Okay. Sorry, I've been having uh, technology issues. I'm on a different device now. Yeah, um, indeed. One, one of the things I'd just like to tease out here is that uh, Mr. Marr previously mentioned that the screen was, you know, it looked like it was all men making the decision today. Uh, and... Uh, I was just hoping that we could just reassure people that, for example, to arrive at this position, uh, this point today, we've been, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of the input, most of the input has actually been uh, through women, yourself, Alison, Jeffrey, Sandy, uh, mm. and a whole group of um, others, including um, the people who do our commission services at the moment. And we, we have, um, uh, it's not just suddenly happened, we've consulted as much as we possibly can and including a lot of women yeah absolutely agree with that um yeah you're right it does look like it's a load of men making a decision yes, indeed. um yeah. but no um i have i've read the report before today's meeting and i have been consulted um fully it kind of sit it's ta obviously uh for councillor corkery's sake um it part in a way part of the directorate that is the the bulk of my Portfolio. So I've worked alongside Councillor Hunt on this, and we've had several meetings where we've teased out the the issues and trying to look at the best the best way to try and support the maximum number of people in the in the clearest possible way. I think that's that that was a big a big issue is that for people needing help, that actually what they need is clarity and ease of and simplicity of communication to get that help. Um, rather than trying to sort of find a find their way, but yes, I have been consulted throughout. Okay. Is there anything that you'd like to uh, feed into the meeting, uh, uh, like statements or questions you have for anybody, Councillor? No, I, I apologise for being late. So obviously, I've missed the presentation. But um, if I mean, you'll know of the same issues covered from the meeting that we had the other day. In which case, I'm. I think so, so for anybody watching this meeting, this has been to a pre-meeting of the community safety portfolio involving a number of people, and it's also been to the uh, pre-meeting a discussion within um, Councillor Horton's um, uh, role. Uh, uh, did you want to explain what you do, Councillor Horton, within the council, for example? Uh, so I'm the cabinet member for children, families, and education, and um, and and. And part of that role is about, I suppose, looking for synergy and looking for opportunities of pulling all the kind of different um, departments that come under that broad umbrella together um, and actually placing the person in the center and trying to arrange the resources around that person. So if somebody is in a situation where they're suffering from domestic abuse, then in actual fact that um, in an ideal world, then all of the relevant people in the council, um, both directly in terms of working with organisations who deal with support for domestic abuse, but also the family around that person, um, that, that we that the ideal situation would be the most efficient and effective way for them and sometimes you have to scrutinise what's happened previously and there's always a tale of why something is like it is and just scrutinise that and just think actually is there a, a better way of doing this or using limited funding of course to maximise um, the service that um, these that people would receive. So that's the kind of main point I think I'd make All not right, having to listen to any okay. previous So people like to know People would like to know if you've ever experienced kind of stuff like this in your life. So, um, in my home, when I was younger, my my sisters and I, my brother, not so much my brother, but uh, yeah, it was uh, almost every weekend on a Friday and Saturday, we had to stop my father from assaulting my mum. And some of the 
incidents were pretty grim. And, um, uh, you know, it was not uncommon to come down and pull my father off my mother. And uh, sometimes the police would calm, and sometimes they didn't. Back in those days, they always just tried to calm things down. And Kirsty Mell is quite right. People like that should be arrested and dealt with, and the full force of the law should come should be rained down upon their head. But, but my mum loved my dad, and she would not leave him. She would not leave him, even if I begged him. I begged her to leave my dad. And my mum died at 48, very sadly, from Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, you know, sometimes they had very, very happy times, and sometimes the times were very, very violent. For us children, it was frightening, absolutely frightening. You know, to see your own father doing these things. <clears throat> I earnestly believe it's okay to, to, to fling the person in jail, to try and um, um, punish them, for assaulting women and other people too. What we fail to do is to address the reasons why that person does it, or in sometimes mutually abusive relationships where they both do it. So we do have to change that. Too many women are being killed. Too many women are being hurt within their own homes and elsewhere. And we see this uh, too much. So we can stick to the to the old way of chucking the, the, these people in jail, or we can seek to um, try and find a different way to resolve the problems within the relationships. Um, so that's my experience. So we, this has also been through um, Judith Smythe, Terry Norton, um, Cal and Gemma News. So a lot of people have been involved in bringing this uh, report to this point now. Um, and I'm concerned to deliver the best possible outcome for those trapped in abusive relationships and to ensure that they are looked after and that they can access these services in the most efficient possible way. I've heard evidence where somebody can ring one, one part of the service, um, be referred along the line and wait for days to get a, uh, get a proper reply and be assessed uh, for the most appropriate um, part of the service. So that has to stop. We want people to be able to um, be looked after straight away. Also, around the, the cash, it is absolutely correct to point out that the funding for this city, for this city has been reduced 40% by central government, yet it, we, we continue as a local authority and all sorts of uh, political leadership to continue to look after as best we can um, these domestic abuse, uh, stop domestic abuse services. Uh, as described by Mr. Ma, uh, and indeed by going to the voluntary sector, uh, people, these groups will be able to access more money than they can get right now, and we will continue to look after them with this billion, multi-million pound contract. So I've heard everything. I need to make a decision because my battery is running low and the lead won't work after my dog skewed the lead earlier on. So uh, I've read the report and it's up to me now to decide, and I'm going to agree the recommendations in the report. Four. Okay, so I think that's about it now, Jane, isn't it? Yes, it is, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Pardon? Peter will um, Peter will turn off the live stream. He'll let yeah, you know right, when it's stopped. Yes, I'd like to thank everybody who supported me and uh, coming to this uh, decision. I'm most grateful for the attendance of everybody today and Miss Mellor for her. Um, deputation earlier on and we have listened to it, all of us. Thank you all very much and I close the meeting.